All right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be doing section 5.2 from the book, and this is where we finally get to explore the trigonometric functions. These are the functions that the whole class is basically about, uh, so I'm excited to introduce you to them, and we're going to start by just talking about circles. So let's take a look at the slides, and we'll get going. All right. So, like I said, this is section 5.2. Uh, here's an overview. We're going to talk about the equations of circles to begin with. Then we'll talk about the unit circle, which we're going to base pretty much everything off of, the unit circle. Then we'll talk about the six trigonometric functions, evaluating them at the quote-unquote standard angles, and then evaluating them using a circle of radius r instead of just radius 1. So here we go. Um, let's start with what the equation of a circle is going to look like. So let r be some kind of positive number, any positive number, and let h and k be fixed numbers, constants. Let x and y be just standard Cartesian coordinates in the usual Cartesian plane. Then the Pythagorean theorem will actually yield that the equation of a circle centered at h comma k with radius r is given by this equation, this equation. And What's nice is that if you recognize these letters H and K from previous, we'll see them again later as well. Um, if you recognize them from previous classes, those are what are gonna give us our shifts away from the origin, horizontal and vertical shifts. R is the radius of the circle. That's why we have, that's why we have R on this side right here. And if you remember the Pythagorean theorem, the Pythagorean theorem basically says that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Right, And that's the formula that we're using to get this formula here for the equation of a circle. And we'll explore it in a lot more detail in this class and especially in the next few slides and later on as well. Um, in this class, we're going to introduce trigonometry from a unit circle perspective, but we'll appeal to some of the special right triangles to do so. And then we'll connect it to right triangle trigonometry later. So for now, focusing on circles, this is the relationship that you need to be comfortable with, the equation of a circle, radius r, centered at h comma k. Here's a picture of an example. So this right here, this is a circle that's centered at the point 2 comma 1, and it's got a radius of 1.75. So if you look down here, that's the equation of the circle pictured. So you can see that it's going to be x minus 2, because in the x direction, the center of the circle has been shifted to 2. And then it's y minus 1, because in the positive direction, the y direction, the, shirt, the circle has been shifted 1 unit up. So those numbers, h and k, are giving you your, your, your shifts from the origin, you, can you could say. And then 1.75 is the radius, so we have 1.75 squared. All right, now for the special case when the circle is centered at the origin, we know that h and k are both going to be 0, so our equation just becomes this one. So this x squared plus y squared equals r squared, that's just the equation of a circle of radius r centered at the origin. So for example, here's a circle of radius 1.75 centered at the origin. Now, one thing that you want to take note of is that the equation of a circle is not a function. So it's not a function of x or y as it's written. And you can kind of see it if you think about it, right? If you, if you wanted to solve one of those for x or y, then you're going to end up with multiple results. And remember that a function, it's a rule where when you put something into it, you only get one output at a time. So if you, if you put something into a function box and it spits out two things, then that box isn't a function after all. It's just a relation. And that's what this is. So this equation is relating x and y in the form of a circle. So if you were to try to solve for one of those variables, x or y, this is what you would get. Let's solve for y first. So first, we're going to subtract x squared from both sides so that we get this. And then we're going to take the square root of y to get plus or minus the square root of r squared minus x squared. And the plus minus is important here. So the general rule is this, like if you ever wonder, like should you include a plus or minus? The answer is if you are introducing a square root to a problem, you must include a plus minus. 
And then you might have to get rid of one of the cases. So for example, if it's like distance, then you would end up getting rid of the negative result. But whenever you introduce a square root, like you take the square root of something, you must include a plus minus. Now, if a square root is just given to you, like written down, given to you, you just take it at face value, positive or negative, however it's written. All right, but what's cool about this is this. So the equation that relates x and y in the form of a circle, that's not a function. But here, we solved for y, and what we got is we actually got two different functions, two different functions. So in the first case, the positive, oops, the positive square root represents the upper half of the circle. And the negative square root represents the lower half of the circle. And those are both functions of x. So let me go back to the previous slide here. Let's take a look at this circle. Um, let me get a different color. We'll use pink here. OK, so what I'm saying is that the upper half of this circle here, in this case, our radius is r, right? So this is the function y equals square root r squared minus x squared. This is the positive one. So this upper upper half circle you see, that has the equation y equals r squared minus x squared. And it's a function of x. Notice if you put in an x value and you map it up to the circle, you'll get one output. There you go. So that's a function of x. Now, if you were to instead take the negative square root, if you were to take the negative square root, then what you're going to get is the bottom half of the circle. So let me highlight that. Oop. There we go. So this bottom half of the circle, this is the function y equals negative square root r squared minus x squared, just like so. So now, now you can see it, right? When you solve for y, it gets split up into two cases. So you can always remember that. Um, there's another thing here. We didn't have to solve for y. We could have solved for x. So we could have gone through the same procedure that we were doing here. Right? Go through this same procedure, except this time solve for x instead of y. And what you'll get is this down here. You'll get that x is equal to plus or minus r squared minus y squared. And maybe you can guess what those two functions are going to represent. Think about it for a minute when I go back to the while well, I go back to the previous slide. What do you think plus root what do you think the positive square root of r squared minus y squared will be? And what do you think the negative square root of r squared minus y squared will be on the circle? All right? Think about it for a second while I go back to the previous slide. All right, did you figure it out? Let's see. OK, so if we solve that equation for x instead of y, we're going to have functions of y. And what that means is y becomes our input. Now, the positive square root, x equals positive square root r squared minus y squared, that's going to represent the right side. That's going to represent the right side of the circle, this piece. There you go. So that's the positive one. Let me move it over here. So you plug in a y value and you get out an x value that's on the that side of the circle. So now what do you think the negative square root is going to be? Mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody's saying it. That's right. Let me go ahead and get a different color here. This is going to be the left side of the circle. There we go. So you have these really nifty geometric interpretations of these of these equations, right? You can talk about the top half of the circle, the bottom half, the right side, the left side. So that's pretty nice. That's pretty nice. OK, now let's talk about the unit circle. So a circle of radius 1 is called a unit circle because 1 is the unit. Then the unit circle centered at 0, 0, that's the foundation for all of trigonometry all the trigonometry that we're going to talk about. So we're going to see like the big picture in just a minute, but you're going to be thinking about this, this image, the unit circle, a lot in this class. So you want to focus on it, think about it. 
burn it into your brain because most of the answers to the questions that we ask will boil down to thinking about this object, the unit circle. So first off, <laughs> the equation of the unit circle is this, x squared plus y squared equals one. The radius is one, right? The radius of this circle right here is one. And we're talking about all the points on that circle of radius one. Okay, now we're gonna let P be a point on the unit circle. So if we pick a point on the unit circle, we know that it satisfies this equation right here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna let theta be the measure of the angle between the positive x-axis and the ray that passes through the point x comma y. So if we go back a slide for a second here, right, let's pick an angle theta, angle theta, and this is gonna be the ray, or actually here, let me start with the point, right? Let's pick a point on the circle, whichever one we want. There you go, point x comma y. We're gonna pass a ray through that point, and there's gonna be an angle associated with it. Standard position, right? So that's the angle theta that leads you up to that ray. That's the idea. Okay, so now as theta changes, the point is gonna move around the circle. And as the point moves around the circle, that changes theta. So these two, this location and this angle are intimately connected, right? So think about back here, if P goes around and around the circle, right? It goes this way, that's gonna change the value of theta. And if you change the value of theta, that's gonna change the point P that you're talking about, right? Right, so that, that does that make sense? Because then P can keep going around and around and we can talk about theta associated with that point. Okay. In other words, what we're saying is that we can parameterize the circle with the angle theta. Parameterize basically means we can decide the exact location of that point based on theta alone. That's the idea. So how do we do that? How do we describe the exact location of that point? Well, we describe the vertical displacement and the horizontal displacement. That's what's happening here. X and Y are giving you vertical and horizontal displacement right? X is horizontal displacement, Y is vertical displacement. And that's what we're going to keep track of. Because if you can say how far to the left or right something is, and how far up or down something is, then you can say where it is on the Cartesian plane, and you can say where it is on this unit circle, right? So what we're going to do differently now is we're going to let that displacement be a function of theta. So let me highlight that here. Yeah, exactly. We're going to describe the vertical displacement of the point as a function of theta, and we're going to describe the horizontal displacement as a function of theta too. And that's how we're going to do it. All right, so here we go. Here is the big picture. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All of trigonometry boils down to this picture, I swear. So this is the picture that you want to have burned into your brain. This is the picture you want to have tattooed. Like this is the picture that gives us all of the basics and all of the foundation for trigonometry that we're gonna talk about. So here's the idea. We're going to call the horizontal displacement of that point cosine theta. So we're gonna say that the X coordinate of that point is cosine theta. Then we're gonna say that the vertical displacement is sine theta. So in other words, we're going to say that y is sine of theta. So you've got this point on the circle. It's the point x comma y on the unit circle. It's the point x comma y. And we're going to say that its horizontal displacement is cosine theta, and its vertical displacement is sine theta. And that's it. That's the big picture. So as long as you remember that, everything else just kind of follows from that. Everything else just follows from that y or, or sine is vertical displacement, cosine is horizontal displacement, all right? So we're gonna use that to our advantage a lot here, but th that's, the, that's the basic idea. So being more specific, this is how we define it. The sine function is defined as sine theta equals y, where y is the vertical displacement or y is the y coordinate of that point p. So like I'd mentioned in the previous slide, the sine function gives the vertical displacement of the point p. That's the big takeaway here. Sine is the vertical displacement. Um, one thing to note about this function, because this is just a function of an angle theta, the domain can be any real number. 
where the domain is any real number. Yeah, remember theta can be any real number, any angle you want. And that can describe the location of a point on the circle. So there you go. <laughs> the domain of the sine function is all real numbers. Now, look at the range by comparison. So the vertical displacement of that point can only be as big as 1 or as small as negative 1. So the range of the sine function is negative 1 to 1. Okay, let's go back and look at the picture again. Let's go back and look at the picture. And let's just focus on sine of theta for a minute, right? Now, like I was saying before, theta, you can go around and around and around and around. You could even go backward, right? You could go backward around and around and around and around. So the domain of the sine function is any real number. But look at what the vertical displacement does. And we're going to study this in, in great detail in section 5.3. But the, the vertical displacement basically goes from 0 all the way up to 1. Here, let me use a better color than that. Here we go. It goes from 0 all the way up to 1, and then all the way back down to negative 1, and then all the way back up to 1. And as this point goes around and around and around, oops, <laughs> as this point goes around and around, all that happens to the y coordinate is it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. But the farthest it can possibly reach is positive 1, and then the lowest it can possibly reach is negative 1. So that's where we get this. The, si the, um, the range of the sine function is negative 1 to 1. Now, another way of expressing that in an important way is this, that the size of sine has to be less than or equal to 1. The absolute value of it is less than or equal to 1. And we'll use that a lot in this class, and you'll see it a lot in Calc 1 as well. All right, now, <laughs> um, maybe uh, similarly, the cosine function is just defined as the x-coordinate. There you go. So the cosine function is the x-coordinate of that point P on the unit circle, and the cosine function gives the horizontal displacement of the point P. That's the big idea. Um, similarly as before, theta can be any real number, so the domain of the cosine function is r, it's any real number, but just like with the displacement for sine, the smallest that cosine can be is negative 1 and the largest is 1, so it goes back and forth, back and forth, ne from negative 1 to 1. Let's take another look at the picture. Right, so now let's see. I think I was using green before. So we're looking at this, right? Cosine theta. So as the point P moves around and around the circle, as theta changes, then what happens is the displacement goes from 1 to 0 to negative 1, and then it goes back to 0, and then back to 1, and then back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So the range of the cosine function is negative 1 to 1. All the possible outputs are between negative 1 and 1. Put another way, the, the largest size, the absolute value of cosine theta, is less than or equal to 1. That's the idea. OK, so ponder those two functions deeply. And I, I encourage you to basically just stare at this for a minute. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? Here, I'm going to throw up the thinker, and I want you to just stare at this picture for a minute, look at all the little details, and just try to burn that picture into your brain and make sense of it. Okay, there we go. So now hopefully it's cemented in there because we're going to keep referring back to it over and over and over again. You'll hear me say, oh, just think about the unit circle. Just imagine the unit circle a bunch of times. This is what I mean. Okay, so we got sine, we got cosine. Now let's talk about tangent. So there's another trigonometric function called the tangent function, and it's just defined as the ratio of the sine and cosine functions. More specifically, tangent is sine over cosine. Or you could write it as y over x, where y is the y-coordinate of the point p, and x is the x-coordinate of the point p. 
So that that's what it is right there. That's what tangent is. Um, intuitively, what tangent tells you is tangent gives you the slope of the line passing through the origin and the point P. That's what the tangent function tells you. So when you try to imagine it intuitively, kind of like you can on uh, for sine and cosine, just think about it as the slope of that line, the slope of the line that passes through the point P. Let's go back to the picture for a minute. So here we are. Here's the line that's passing through the point P. Okay, tangent is the slope of that line. That's the easiest way to put it. Tangent is the slope of that line. And as P moves around the circle, the slope will change, right? The line will tip up and down. Um, it'll go flat <laughs> if P is on the X axis. It'll be vertical if P is on the Y axis. But if it's vertical, remember then we don't have any slope, right? You can't have a you can't have an infinite slope in some senses. All right, and we're gonna actually we're gonna need that to make sense of the um, the domain, but we'll get there in just a second. So uh, if you needed some more convincing, this is just another quick example of or a quick breakdown of why tangent is just the slope of that line. So if you think about it like that, that's what tangent is. All right. So what is the domain? I had mentioned the thing about not having undefined slope, not having infinite slope. Not You can't really have, uh, you can have vertical lines, but those lines don't have any slope because, you know, <laughs> the rise is infinite and the run is, is zero. Or I should say that the, the rise is whatever you want it to be, but the run is zero. So um, because of that, that means that the domain of the tangent function is restricted. It's not defined for all real numbers. Not at all. And how do you find out what the domain is? Well, the big idea is you can't divide by zero. You can't divide by zero, right? So this function is only defined when the x coordinate of that point is not zero, which makes sense, right? Because if the x coordinate is zero, then you lie on the y axis and the slope would be undefined. So how do we express it? We express it like this the domain of the tangent function is all the angles theta such that cosine theta is not zero, not zero. Any other value of cosine works, but not when cosine is zero. So what you do is you basically figure out what those angles are going to have to be, and you cut those out of the real numbers. <laughs> so more specifically, the domain of the tangent function is this. And let me detail what this is really saying, OK? So this is saying that theta can be any real number as long as theta is not equal to one of these numbers. In other words, 2k plus 1 times pi over 2. 2k plus 1 times pi over 2. Uh, the k value here, the k is just representing any integer. And that's what this says right here. k is an integer. That fancy z symbol. That fancy z, that represents the integers, the set of the integers, all the positive and negative whole numbers. And this little symbol here, the little e, <laughs> it looks kind of like uh, this right here, the little e, that just means in. So this just means the word in, <laughs> or uh, is an element of, if you want to get more precise. So if we read this domain again, what it says is that theta is equal to any real number as long as theta is not this multiple of pi over 2. Now, one thing I'll point out is this. Uh, go back to the unit circle. So if you want to make sense of why this is true, where is the angle pi over 2 on the unit circle? That's one of the ones that you have to memorize, right? Here we go. <laughs> Let's go back to the picture. We'll go back over and over and over again, right? This is the angle pi over 2 straight to there, right? And we know that that line, the line passing through that point, if P was up here, right? It has no slope. The slope is undefined. So we know that theta can't be pi over 2 if we want to talk about the tangent of that angle theta. But same thing with this line right here, right? Or this ray, I'll say. So if you go around and around to here, now you're at 3 pi over 2. And tangent of that angle will also be undefined because you're still going to have vertical slope, right? Or a vertical line that has no slope. 
Okay, but then, remember, you can keep going around and around. We're going to see that a lot today. You can keep going around and around. And so if your angle is here, if you go all the way back around to pi over 2 after going a full rotation, there's another angle that you have to cut out to get the domain of the tangent function. So in other words, what you, what you start to realize once you look at the pattern is that you're going to have to cut out every odd multiple of pi over 2. Because this is, let me go back through it here. Right, this is one pi over two, this is three pi's over two, this is five pi over two, oops, <laughs> I mean, this is five pi over two, and then this is, oops, went too far, <laughs> and then this is seven pi over two, and you basically have to cut out all the odd multiples of pi over two. And that is exactly what oops, this says. 2k plus one is an odd number, pi over 2 is pi over 2, so the tangent function is defined except for odd multiples of pi over 2. All right, so that's the domain. Now, the range is all real numbers. <laughs> the range is all real numbers. Why is that? Well, the slope of a line can have any slope. It can be any real number from negative infinity to positive infinity, not including those numbers because those are not real numbers. So the, the tangent function, its range is all real numbers, any slope. There you go. <laughs> all right, so those are the three primary ones, sine, cosine, and tangent. Those are the three primary functions, the three primary trigonometric functions. You want to become intimately familiar with them, like they're your best friends, like you would hang out with them all the time. Like you want to get to know those functions very, very well, sine, cosine, and tangent. We'll use them forever from now on. Now, the other six, I'm sorry, the other three trigonometric functions are just the reciprocals of these ones. So quite literally, take those three functions we just saw and reciprocate them. Throw them in the denominator. <laughs> That's the idea. So here you go. Oops, here you go. What is the cosecant function? The cosecant function is just the reciprocal of the sine function. There you go reciprocal of the sine function. So take the value for sine and flip it multiplicatively. There you go, <laughs> right? Take the reciprocal of it. Um, and that's pretty much all it is. Now that's definitely going to affect the domain and the range. So check out the domain and range now. So the domain of the cosecant function is going to be everywhere as long as sine is not zero. We can't have sine of theta be equal to zero. So how do we figure that out? Go back to the unit circle picture and then find where sine is going to be zero and then cut all those points out. And you'll see this is what you get. So you have to cut out all the multiples of pi because when, <laughs> when your angle is a multiple of pi, you're going to be horizontal, right? And sine will be zero. Because remember, pi's, multiples of pi is just land you back on the x-axis as you go around and around. Oh, wait, as you go around and around. <laughs> there you go. So domain is everything except any multi any any integer multiple of pi. Now, what's the range going to be? Well, it's kind of hard to see immediately that the range is going to be this. Negative infinity to negative 1, union 1, 2, positive infinity. But if you remember that important point that we made, that we need sine of theta to be, or I mean, sine of theta is always going to be less than or equal to 1, then when you reciprocate it, that relationship will be flipped. So when you reciprocate the sine function, the inequality flips directions. So this is just saying that, <laughs> but what is this function here? This function is the absolute value of cosecant. So this is saying that cosecant, the absolute value of it has to be greater than or equal to one. And so that's why you get this. That's the domain. Okay, now similarly, you can take the cosine function and you can reciprocate it. And that's going to give you what we call the secant function. So let me go back to green here. Secant is just the reciprocal of cosine, just like so. <laughs> take the x value, reciprocate it. Uh, another important point I'll make right here, uh, <laughs> the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. And the reciprocal of cosine is secant. 
So you want to make sure that you get those you get those in the right order because they're not uh, they don't tie up exactly the way that you would think. You want to remember that the reciprocal of sine is the cosecant function. The reciprocal of sine is cosecant. So it takes a bit of getting used to, but I'm sure you'll be able to make sense of it over the course of the the course for sure. All right, moving on to domains and ranges again. How do we find the domain and the range? Well, we just need cosine to not be equal to zero. And so if cosine is not going to be equal to zero, that means our angle theta can't be an odd multiple of pi over two. Can't be on that, can't be on the vertical line. Can't be on the y-axis, right? There we go. So you just cut all those points out and then every other angle is good, except for those odd multiples of pi over two. And then just like we did for the secant function, if you want to find the range, you use the important fact that the cosine function is bounded by one and negative one, <laughs> and then you reciprocate that and you'll get that, the secant function, absolute value of it is greater than or equal to one. And that's the idea. And so that's how you get this domain. I'm sorry, uh, this range. All right, so Last one, the cotangent function. So what's the cotangent function? And then we'll see some examples here. The cotangent function is just the reciprocal of the tangent function. So take tangent, reciprocate it, and you'll get cosine theta over sine theta instead. Oops, there we go. Reciprocate tangent and you'll get cosine over sine. All right, and that'll affect the domain and range, of course. So the domain of the cotangent function is just when sine is not equal to zero. That's going to be for any angle that's not an integer multiple of pi. And the range, well, the range is going to be r again. <laughs> it's going to be all real numbers again, because you're still going to have the slope of a line, as long as it's not zero, right? As long as the, um, the slope of the reciprocal of the line is not zero, you'll still have any possible slope, any possible slope. All right. So those are the six trigonometric functions. We've got them all now. Sine, cosine, what is it? Cosecant, secant, cot oh, I forgot tangent. Sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. Whew. Okay, so you'll get lots and lots of practice with those, um, but let's do some examples now. Let's just try to evaluate them and make sense of them. So here we go. Uh, let's say we have this point on the unit circle. The point negative one half comma square root three over two. Let's find the values of all six of the trigonometric functions of that point, right? So remember, how do you start? You go back to the big picture. You think about the unit circle. You think about what is x, what is y. Well, here x is one half. I'm sorry, negative one half. But remember, x is cosine theta. And y is going to be root 3 over 2. Well, that's sine of theta. So we know what cosine theta is, and we know what sine of theta is, and all of the other trigonometric functions are just defined in terms of sine and cosine, right? Tangent is sine over cosine. Cotangent is cosine over sine. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. And uh, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So just by knowing these two values, you get all the rest of them for free just like so. So here we go, right? That's going to be root three over two. That's going to be negative one half. How do you compute tangent? You just take the ratio of sine and cosine, root three over two over negative one half, and that's going to give you negative root three. There we go. How do you find cosecant? You reciprocate the sine function and you'll get two over root three. And you can just leave it like that. You don't need to rationalize the denominator unless you really want to. Um, sometimes you might have to do it on the homework. It might require you to. But in general, I don't require you to have to rationalize the denominator. You can leave square roots in the denominator. That's OK. Um, and yeah, and you keep going. What's secant? Reciprocal of cosine. If I reciprocate negative 1 half, I get negative 2. Cotangent, reciprocal of tangent. Just like so. Not too bad. So if you know the point, you know all those functions. All right, now let's evaluate them at the quadrantal angles 0, pi over 2, pi, 
and three pi over two. Let's see what the functions are gonna be. How do you do this type of thing? How do you evaluate these functions? The big picture, you go back to the unit circle, the one that you've got tattooed in your brain now, <laughs> and you think about what that picture looks like and you'll be able to read off the values from that picture in your head. And that's it. So let's look at the angle zero. Let's start with theta equals zero. Okay, if theta is equal to zero, what I'm imagining is the unit circle. Okay, very rough sketch in my head, right? And angle zero, this is what the ray is gonna look like. So here's my point. So right away, I can see that cosine of theta, or sorry, cosine of zero is gonna be one, sine of zero is gonna be zero, tangent of zero is gonna be sine of zero over cosine of zero, which is just gonna be, what's sine of zero? Zero over one, which is zero. And you just get all the rest, just like that. What is secant? Secant of zero is gonna be what? One over cosine, oops, cosine zero, which is one over one, which is one. What's cosecant gonna be? Cosecant zero is one over sine of zero, which is one over zero, eh, undefined, right? <laughs> undefined. If sine of zero is zero, cosine of, uh, cosecant is not defined there. And that's back in the, the calculation of the domain. So this one is not defined. And then what about tangent? Let's try that or cotangent. I'll have to do it over here. Cotangent of zero, that's going to be cosine of zero over sine of zero. Uh-oh. Cosine zero is one, sine of zero, zero, and eh. no good. So not defined there. But remember, we took care of that. We cut all of those points out of the domain for the cotangent function. So there you go. In a nutshell, oh, there you go. So in a nutshell, this is what you get. Oh, I see, I, I did it this way instead, my, my apologies. So I did sine of zero, cosine of zero, tangent of zero, cosecant zero, <laughs> secant zero. Just like so. Okay, now let's go back. Now let's go back. So here is, here's me just saying, imagine the picture in your head again, right? So now let's do pi over two and you can repeat the process. What is sine of pi over two? What's cosine pi over two? What's tangent pi over two? And you just imagine this picture and fill it out. So we can do all the angles at once since that's how I've got it written here. Let me do this. Okay, let me try. This, okay, so sine of zero is zero. What's sine of pi over two? Think about the unit circle again. Pi over two is this way. Sine of that angle is gonna be one. Sine of pi, well, here's pi looking this way. It's gonna be zero. Three pi over two, it's gonna be this way. It's gonna be negative one. So sine of three pi over two is negative one and you can keep going. So these ones, again, it's really, really quite convenient. You just have to remember that picture, remember the unit circle, and everything just follows from that. So let me do this. Uh, take a minute to yourself. I want you to think about that and try to figure out these ones down here. See if you can see why these ones are true. Just take a minute and see if you can see it. Okay, now let's go on to the next one. Hopefully you can see that from the, the, the big picture of the unit circle. Let's move on to tangent. So tangent, you can do the calculations, right? Just do sine over cosine, plug in those values and that'll tell you if it's zero, if it's undefined, if it's some other slope. So we, say, we saw this one already. Tangent of pi is gonna be zero. Tangent pi over two is undefined. But we saw that before when we were looking at the uh, the actual construction of tangent, how it was derived, right? It's the slope of the line connecting the origin and the point P. So <laughs> if the angle is pi over two, it's a vertical line. So tangent is not defined at that point. Same thing with three pi over two. Now you're looking at the, the downward pointing vertical, <laughs> vertical line, right? The vertical ray. That's gonna be undefined. The slope is not gonna be defined. So tangent three pi over two is not defined. All right, and then you can keep going. So cosecant, secant, and I'll leave it to you to try to evaluate those ones on your own. 
But again, think about the picture and that's how you get it. All right, so then let's try this. Let's try to evaluate some exact values of these sine functions. So these ones are, are also versions of the standard angles. So let's see how we can do it. We wanna do sine of three pi and cosine of negative 270 degrees. Well, how do you do it? You imagine the unit circle, <laughs> but uh, as a point moves around the unit circle, it's gonna repeat every two pi radians. So here, for sine of 3 pi, that angle is larger than 2 pi. So we've got to kind of figure out where the point is going to be. Um, but remember, the point will just repeat its position as it goes around and around the circle. So you can still evaluate these functions just by using the regular unit circle. You just have to basically look for the remaining revolution you've got to do after cutting out all the 2 pi repetitions. That's the idea. So as you go around and around and around, the circle just keeps revisiting the same points every two pi radians. So look at your angle, oops, look at your angle and cut out all of the multiples of two pi. So basically subtract out all of the multiples of two pi. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> yeah, subtract all the multiples of two pi until you have an angle that's less than two pi. And this is actually a form of what's called modular arithmetic. So if you wanna learn more about it, you can click on this link and it'll take you to the Wikipedia page for modular arithmetic. Um, but you've been doing it your whole life, actually. You've been doing it a lot. And modular arithmetic is very, very common in mathematics. The, the example that I like to use is clock arithmetic. So if any of you use a 24-hour clock, you're probably used to dividing by 12 and looking at the remainder. <laughs> so what's 1,700 hours, for example? 1,700 hours. Well, you would subtract 12, right? And then you'll get 5. That's 5 p.m. Or if you do, like, what is it, um, 1,300 hours. Well, if you subtract 12, you get 1. So that's 1 p.m. There you go. That's modular arithmetic. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. So how do we evaluate sine of 3 pi? Well, look, we can write 3 pi as 2 pi plus pi. So the 2 pi we can basically ignore. We can toss out the 2 pi because that's just going to send our point right back to where it was originally. So we'll cut out 2 pi. Instead of evaluating sine of 3 pi, we can evaluate sine of pi, which we know is 0. There you go. And these are all equal. These are equal. So that's why I'm using an, an equal sign here. Sine of 3 pi, the sine of that angle, is the sine of the angle pi. And the sine of angle pi is zero. Why is that? Well, I go back to the picture. <laughs> angle pi is right here. Okay, the sine of that angle is zero. The vertical displacement of that ray is zero. And that's it, that's all there is to it. All right, so then what about cosine of negative 270? Well, negative 270 degrees, sorry, negative 270 degrees. So now you're gonna move in the clockwise direction, right? So maybe you need to go like this, wait, there you go. No, no, <laughs> still can't get it right, it's backward. Maybe if I do this, I don't know. Um, uh, so you're gonna move clockwise in this case, but you're just gonna go 270 degrees around. So you imagine the unit circle, maybe draw a little sketch of it, here it is. We're gonna go this way, but we need to go this direction, 270 degrees. So we're gonna go 90, 180, 270. All right, so this was the angle theta. Now we just need to find the cosine of this angle, but that's just gonna be the same as the cosine of the angle 90 degrees. So cosine of negative 270 degrees is cosine of 90 degrees, and we can tell from the picture that that's gonna be zero. Zero horizontal displacement at that point. All right, now, this is where things get triangular, you could say. So <laughs> evaluating these functions at the standard angles turns out to be a lot easier than it seems. I know that a lot of students, when they take this class, they will try to memorize all of these values of the unit circle. There's, there's a classic printout that you can find on, online, just Google it. It'll have all of the angles and all the little details and all of those things. And I know students really try to like memorize that whole picture, 
but I, I discourage you from doing that. I really don't think you should do that. Just remember the big picture of the unit circle, what sine and cosine are, and then you just need to remember these two special right triangles. That's really all you need to know. If you've got all of those memorized, if you can remember the lengths of the legs of these triangles here, and you can remember the picture, the big picture of the unit circle, you can evaluate any trigonometric function at the standard angles really quickly, really quickly. Because as it turns out, oh yeah, I say it right here, as it turns out, these nice standard angles, or th these standard angles exhaust all of the nice values. So what I mean is, if you want other values of sine and cosine and tangent and all the rest, you're gonna have to do essentially an approximation, a numerical approximation. You won't get a simple, a simple thing with one radical that's got a nice, concise, quick answer. It's gonna be some wild number. But we can talk about that more when you get to Calc 1. So for now, let's just start with this. Um, these are the two special right triangles. Maybe you saw them before in geometry. Um, you should memorize these triangles. These are what you need to memorize. So there's the 30, 60, 90 triangle. Right? And then there's the 45, 45, 90 triangle. And we'll start with this one. We'll start with the 45, 45, 90. So the idea is this. This is a triangle. Oops. This is a triangle that has a hypotenuse of length 1. And that's exactly what we want, because for us, on the unit circle, our unit circle has radius 1. So if you could imagine this triangle centered in standard position, like so, this would be the radius. Sorry, it's a really bad sketch, but hopefully you can kind of imagine it in your head now. That's what we're looking at, right? Now, the length of the leg of this triangle is root 2 over 2 on both sides because it's an isosceles triangle, right? So that's root 2 over 2. That's root 2 over 2. But this is great because what that means is that if our angle is 45 degrees and we're looking at this point on the unit circle, we know sine and cosine like that. We know it already. That's it. <laughs> so any multiple of 45 degrees, any multiple of pi over 4, we can imagine this triangle and we know that the legs are going to be root 2 over 2, except maybe positive or negative, depending on if the triangle is in a certain quadrant or not. And that's it. That's it. I think that's what I say over here, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so that's, that's the first one. That's the 45, 45, 90. Now let's look at the 30, 60, 90 triangle. So let me clear this. Delete. Clear that. Okay, now let's look at this one for a minute. Just like before, this triangle has a hypotenuse of length 1. And so if you imagine it centered in standard position, this would be the unit circle. There you go. And again, if this is our angle theta and this is the point, we can tell immediately what sine and cosine are. Cosine will be 1 half and sine will be root 3 over 2. And that's it. So now we know these values for any multiple of 60, any multiple of 60 up to some sign. That's all you've got to think about. Um, but then we can leverage it the other way. So if our angle that was in standard position wasn't 60, if it was instead 30, then the legs would switch. That's pretty much it. So there's always going to be a long leg and a short leg. And we'll see in the examples in just a minute. But all you've got to do is figure out which one's the long leg, which one's the short leg. And how do you do that? You just think about the unit circle <laughs> and the picture. How does the line look at that standard angle? All right, so let's try an example here. Um, what I want you to try, I want you to try this one on your own first. So think about this for a minute and then try it on your own. All right, how did you do? Let me know. <laughs> um, well, okay, first, how would you do this one? You want to imagine where the angle is. Imagine the unit circle. Where is the angle pi over 4? Unit circle. See, pi over 4, that's this line right here. That's this angle. All right? 
now this is going to be a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So you've got sine is root 2 over 2 and cosine is root 2 over 2. And we're done. That was it. <laughs> that was it. That's all, that's all you have to do. <laughs> there you go. All right. Now try this one. So now try a multiple of pi over 4. Think about it and then try it on your own. I'll put the little writing thing on there so you can try to try to write it out on your own. Okay, now let's do it together. <clears throat> How do you do it? Imagine the unit circle. <laughs> Here we go. Here's the unit circle. Where is that angle 3 pi over 4? Oh, I don't know. 3 pi over 4 is too hard to visualize. Let's think of it as 3 fourths pi. It's 3 fourths of pi. Remember, pi is the upper half, right? Pi is the upper half of the circle. So 3 fourths of it is going to be right about there. There you go. So that's 3 pi over 4. Now, the cool thing here is that this <laughs> triangle right here, that's a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So we already know the lengths of the legs. The lengths of the legs are going to be root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 2. However, because this triangle is in the second quadrant, or I should say the second quadrant, we know that the cosine value, the displacement, the horizontal displacement is going to be negative. So we have this sine of 3 pi over 2, or I'm sorry, 3 pi over 4 is going to be root 2 over 2. That's the vertical displacement. And cosine of 3 pi over 4 is going to be negative root 2 over 2. And that's it. That's how you do it. So this is one of the reasons why I was emphasizing so much that you want to think of these angles as multiples of pi, right? Because if you can visualize what pi looks like, you're just looking at multiples of it, fractions of it, and you're going to count by pies. And if you can count by pies and see them as actual like fractions of pi, see those numbers, then evaluating the trig functions is, is, is not too bad, actually. There's no need to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. Just the big picture and those standard angles. We're going to do some more examples right now, too. Oh, yeah. So this is basically what I went through before. Um, again, just remember that cosine is horizontal displacement. And sine is vertical displacement. OK, how about this one? Oof. OK, cosine 27 pi over 4, sine 27 pi over 4. All right. All right, I think you can do this one. So try this one on your own, and then we'll do it together. All right, now let's do it together. Uh, first thing is imagine the unit circle. <laughs> so we imagine the unit circle. I know I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Imagine the unit circle, and then we've got to figure out where that angle is. So 27 pi over 4, I can't really parse that up in my head too well. But 27 fourths pi, I can make better sense of. It's 27 quarter pies, right? Do a quarter pi. 27 times. But this is going to be a lot bigger than 2 pi. So what we can do is we can mod out by all the 2 pi's, right? There's going to be a bunch of re repeated revolutions. So we can get rid of all of those. Um, let's divide by 4. What do we get? So let's see. We're going to get what is it, 24. So 6 and 3 quarters pi. 6 and 3 quarters pi. That's right. Yeah, 24 plus 3. OK, so check this out. Six of those, we have six pi and then three quarters of a pi. So we're going to go around to six times, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, and then three quarters of a pi. Right there. <laughs> there we go. Three quarters of a pi. Uh, I'll write it like that. Three quarters of a pi. And then once again, we have a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So the lengths are going to be root 2 over 2. And cosine is going to be negative because it's over here on this side. So right away, we'll have cosine of 27 pi over 4 is equal to negative root 2 over 2.
and sine of 27 pi over 4 is going to be root 2 over 2. And that's it. <laughs> that's all you got to do. Don't need to memorize a bunch of angles, just the standard ones, and be able to mod out by 2 pi. Okay, so now, <laughs> oh, this is just what I went through again, so you can read it again on the slides if you'd like. Now, let's do this one. So let's do one that's got a different angle that's not a multiple of pi over 4. This one's going to be pi over 6. So I want you to try this one on your own. So first, try to think about how to do it. And then after you've thought about it for a minute, try to see if you can figure it out yourself. What do you think the first step is going to be? All right, now you try to work it out yourself. You try to work it out. Okay, now let's work it out together. Uh, pi over six, so maybe you guessed the first step is imagine the unit circle or draw the unit circle. <laughs> Where is the angle pi over six? Well, that's one sixth of pi. Actually, let me give myself a little bit of a bigger drawing here. There we go, one sixth of pi. So remember pi is the entire upper half. So one sixth of it is gonna look about like this. About like that. Okay, well guess what? Um, pi over six is equal to 30 degrees. So this is going to form a 30, 60, 90 triangle. 30, 60, 90 triangle. Now, if you remember that triangle, let's flash back really quick. Where is it, where is it, where is it? Where did you go? Right here. Let's flash back. Remember on this 30, 60, 90 triangle, there's a long leg and there's a short leg. Long leg is always root three over two. Short leg is always one half. So whatever these values are, it's gotta be one of those two and then positive or negative. We've gotta decide based on the location. So now let's go back to the problem here. Where is it? Was it this one? Uh, oh, no, wrong one. This one. There we go. Okay. So looking at the picture, we can see that this is going to be the long leg. So that's root 3 over 2. And this is going to be the short leg, which is 1 half. And we're done. That's it. Immediately, we have cosine of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2. And sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. And that's the whole game right there. You just got to determine which one is the long leg and which one is the short leg. And once you have that, check the sign. I mean, check the, the sign if it's positive or negative, And then that's it. There you go. So this is basically what I just said a moment ago. Find the short leg, find the long leg. And we get immediately that that's the value for cosine pi over 6 and sine pi over 6. All right, moving along. Let's do cosine pi over 3 and sine pi over three. Now this one, I bet you can probably do without any help. So you try it on your own and then we'll do it together. All right, here we go. First step, draw the unit circle. Find that angle, pi over three. Pi over three is 60 degrees, right? So it's like taking pi, cutting it into three pieces. So it's gonna be a little larger than pi over six. Here we go. Pi over three. And lo and behold, this forms a 30, 60, 90 triangle. But now the short leg is here and the long leg is here. So immediately we have cosine of pi over three is 1 half, and sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And that's it. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, just imagine the unit circle and find the long leg, find the short leg. That's it. So let me flash back one more time to this slide with the triangles. It's always going to be one of these angles. Or here, let me uh, use orange. Here we go. I'm right, sorry. It's always going to be one of these values. So when you're evaluating these trig functions, sine and cosine, at the standard angles, the values are always going to be one of these. 0, 1 half, root 2 over 2, root 3 over 2, or 1. 
Now, if you're at different angles that aren't the standard angles, then you can get anything. You can get anything between negative one and one for a sine and cosine. So these are the, the one, two, three, four, five values you want to look out for. Zero, one half, root two over two, root three over two and one. Um, if you forget those, I know a few students of mine like to point out the fact that uh, there's a pattern to these angles. <laughs> there's a pattern to these angles. You can write them all with square roots as being square roots over two. So for example, zero is uh, square root zero over two. One half is square root one over two. Root two over two is root two over two. <laughs> root three over two is root three over two, and root four over two is two over two, which is one. There you go. So that's another way to remember it. If you forget what they are, it's literally just the square root of zero, one, two, three, four, divided by two. And those are the possible angles. All right, all right. So if you have more questions about that, just ask, a, ask on the discussion forum and we can talk more about it. But let me go back to where we were. Yes, that's right. Yes, we found these ones. All right, so now here's another good, a good one for you to practice, okay? Um, try to do this one on your own, and then we'll do it together. All right, here we go. 10 pi over 3. Hmm, I can't see 10 pi over 3 very well, but I can see 10 thirds of pi. So what do I do? Draw the unit circle. I need to do 10 thirds of pi. Well, 10 thirds of pi, let's see, how many rotations is that? We can probably mod out by a few, right? So let's see, we're gonna have three and one third pi's. Three and one third pi's. So we're gonna go one, two, three, and then a third of pi. So we'll be down here. There we go. And that was me just counting pies, right? I'm just counting pies going around in a circle, round and around and around. So then, let's see. Well, this is gonna be a multiple of one third. Oops, oops, there we go. It's a multiple of one third, so this is gonna form a 30, 60, 90 triangle. You've just gotta figure out which is the long leg and which is the short leg. So. Uh, the long leg here is root 3 over 2. The short leg here is 1 half. But this triangle is in the third quadrant. So that means that the vertical displacement is negative. So you get negative root 3 over 2. And the horizontal displacement is negative. So you get negative 1 over 2. And that's it. Now we know the answer. So cosine of 10 pi over 3 is going to be negative 1 half and sine of 10 pi over three is gonna be negative root three over two. And there you go, <laughs> there you go. All right, so I've got that typed up on the slides here again as well, where we kind of mod out by two pi. And there you go, and you get the same results. Not too bad, all right. <sighs> okay, almost through. That was the, the bulk of this particular lesson. And honestly, that's kind of the bulk of trigonometry is that picture. So if you felt comfortable with that, you're gonna do really, really well. Because being comfortable with that picture and evaluating it in those ways, that's really what you need to do really, really well. That's like the core idea. The rest of it just kind of builds off of that idea and extends it. So like right now, we're gonna extend this idea a little bit. Um, we're gonna do the trigonometric functions, but now we're gonna use a circle of radius r. And since we've been casting everything in terms of radians, Scaling up by the radius is very natural, <laughs> as you're going to see right now. Arc lengths are preserved, so pretty much we're just going to scale these functions by r, and then that's it. So let's do it. Um, so remember, from section 5.1, the length of a circular arc is uh, r times theta, because you can basically scale up the angle. Well, it turns out that you can just apply that to the vertical and horizontal displacement as well. And we get these very, very convenient formulas. So let's say you've got an angle theta in standard position. Let x comma y be the corresponding point on the circle, but now it's radius r. Then the x coordinate of that point will be r cosine theta, and the y coordinate will be 
are sine theta. And there you go. So you're basically just taking the result from the unit circle and scaling it by your radius. And that's all you need to know. How do you get all of the other trig functions from sine and cosine? You basically just write cosine, write sine, and all the rest fall right out. So here's the here they are down here. And I'll show this connection right here actually. So for let's start with this one. Let's start with this one. Um, if y is r sine of theta, this immediately implies that sine of theta, oops, that sine of theta is equal to y over r. There it is. So we get that for free. <laughs> we get that for free. Same thing with cosine. If x is r cosine theta, that immediately implies that cosine theta is equal to x over r. And there you go. How do you get the other five or the other four trigonometric functions? You use the results for sine and cosine and divide. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Divide or reciprocate. And then you're done. So you'll get all the others right down here. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? Now, um, one thing, maybe you kind of saw it before, uh, if we actually let r equal 1, then we'll recover all the formulas we had previously. So if we let r equal 1, then <laughs> this r just becomes 1. So you'll get this. Actually, maybe I'll um, be sneaky and, and do this. There we go. <laughs> so now x is cosine theta, y is sine theta, and then all of these, you'll get the same thing. <laughs> this would become um, r would be 1, so you get y. r would be 1, so you get x. Uh, r would be 1, so you get 1 over y. Oops, so now i got to do this. <laughs> 1 over y. Uh, r would be 1, so you get 1 over x, and so on and so on. Not too bad. So this is one of the reasons why radians are so nice to use, because you get that scaling property. You get that scaling property. OK, now let me delete all that little. There we go. Um, oh, yeah, also notice that uh, tangent and cotangent don't depend on r. They don't depend on r. r doesn't appear in that formula. And there's a good reason for it. The reason is that the slope of a line doesn't depend on the radius of the circle that the line is intersecting, right? It doesn't matter what the radius of that circle is. All that matters is the rise over the run, the rise over the run. So that's why the radius r doesn't appear in those formulas. All right, one last thing about these before we do an example. Um, these equations that you see here, these ones right here, actually I'll highlight them. <laughs> these ones, you wanna remember these and get comfortable with these too, because we're gonna see them a lot. These are precisely the parametric equations for a circle of radius r centered at the origin. This is basically how you parameterize that circle of radius r. And we'll see them again later on. Uh, you'll see them again even later on <laughs> in Calc 2 as well, because these are what we call the isomorphism equations. These let you convert from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. Polar coordinates we'll actually see. Oh, I'm sorry, from polar coordinates to Cartesian. Polar coordinates we will see later in this class, and then you're going to see them again when you get to Calc 2. So these two equations you're going to see a lot. But hopefully now with this lecture and with these slides and, and now that you've practiced these, hopefully those equations aren't too hard to remember, right? X is the horizontal displacement. That's cosine. Y is the vertical displacement. That's sine. If your circle is radius R instead of 1, multiply those by R. <laughs> That's the big takeaway. Okay. So... One last thing before we call it a day. I know this is a long lecture, so thank you for hanging in there. Let's take a look at ah, okay, let's take a look at this example and see if we can find all of the values of the trig functions. So think about this one for a moment, and then if you want to try it on your own, you can, and then we'll do it together. All right, now try it on your own.
All right, now let's do it together. Let's see if we can figure it out. We're trying to find the exact values of these functions. Uh, we're given a point on the ray formed by theta. So first thing we got to do, draw the circle. <laughs> draw the circle. It says that the point 4, comma, negative 3 is a point on that circle. So let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3. There's that point. So now we can imagine that circle. Pretend it's, uh, it's properly drawn and, and centered and all of that stuff. There we go. Now, we need to know the trig value, uh, the, the values of the trig functions at that point. So here's the ray itself. Okay, what we know so far is that this is negative three. Maybe I'll use a different color here. This is negative three. Oof, not the best. <laughs> there you go. That's negative three. This is four. So guess what we already know? We already know r cosine theta, and we know r sine theta just from looking at this picture. But we don't know what r is. How do you think we could find r? Think about that for a moment. How could we find the number r? All right, I think I have an idea. We're looking at triangles here. We're trying to find this length r. We should use the Pythagorean theorem. So we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what r is, and then we'll know everything. We'll know sine, we'll know cosine, and we get everything else for free. So Pythagorean theorem says that r squared is equal to 4 squared plus negative 3 squared. So that means that r squared is equal to 16 plus 9 which is 25. So we get r is equal to plus or minus root 5. I'm sorry, root 5. What am I saying? Plus or minus root 25. But the square root of 25 is 5. So we get r equals plus or minus 5. Now, because in this case, we're just talking about a positive radius, we can eliminate the negative result and just say that the radius is 5. Sweet. Now we're golden. We know What's, we, we know what sine is going to be, we know what cosine is going to be. Now that we have r, we can get the exact value and we'll get everything else for free. Here we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. So there's the calculation. So remember, actually, let me write this right here. Remember that uh, y was equal to r sine theta. Okay, so this means that what was y? y was equal to negative 3 equals r, which is 5 sine theta. And so this tells you that sine of theta is going to be equal to negative 3 over 5. There we go. Then you can do the same thing for cosine, right? You can do the same thing for cosine. So let's do that. Here we go. We know that, what was it? x was 4, right? x is equual to our, actually, here we go. x is equal to r cosine theta, but we know x is 4, and we know r is 5 cosine theta. So from that, we get cosine theta equals 4 over 5. Boom. <laughs> Once you've got cosine and sine, you can find all the rest. So tangent is sine over cosine, or, or y over x, right? It's going to be y over x which is going to be negative 3 over 4. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. And tangent is the reciprocal of tangent. All right. And that's it. So, whew, man, that's a lot to take in, right? That's a lot, lot, lot to take in. But like I've mentioned a whole bunch of times, I'll say it one last time. Let me pull it up here. What's the big takeaway, the biggest takeaway from today that you can have? It's this picture. This picture right here. So as long as you're comfortable with that picture, then you should be good, all right? Okay. So, uh, yeah, all right. So that's it for today's lecture. Thank you for listening. I know it was long. Uh, I try to keep them brief, but sometimes some of these, some of these ideas, some of these lectures, they're just pack full of information that you're going to need. All right. But other than that, I will see you next time. Happy studying and good luck.